and Waxman. Uh, I just wanted to uh, share with you some uh, results from a, a study we, we've recently conducted looking at, uh, in, in LPR patients undergoing PPI therapy, looking at uh, improvements in, in symptomatology uh, correlated with changes in uh, acid environment, uh, laryngopharyngeal acid environment. So. Uh, over the past 20 years or so, uh, many observational studies have reported between uh, acid reflux and laryngeal symptoms, and some of these studies ha have shown a reduction in symptoms uh, following PPI therapy. This is well known. However, uh, for reasons that remain incompletely understood, most randomized control trials and meta-analyses have shown uh, no benefit uh, to PPI therapy over, over placebo. Uh, and as of yet, no definitive explanations have been offered for some, some of the conflicting results in the literature. And just by way of uh, a brief example of some of the conflicting results in the literature, here are, are results from two of the largest randomized control trials that, that have been conducted to date. And uh, the study on, on the, the left showed uh, only a, about a 15% improvement in, in symptoms in the PPI group, uh, no, not significantly different from uh, the placebo group. Study on the, on the right, however, showed about an 80% uh, improvement in symptoms in, in the PPI group, significantly greater than the, than the placebo group, although a, a, a pretty strong placebo effect was, was noted in that study. Now, unfortunately, and, and, and somewhat surprisingly, most studies have not actually measured or objectively assessed uh, laryngopharyngeal pH after treatment. Uh, and of the studies that have, most actually fail to, to report the, uh, and, uh, changes in symptomatic improvement in relationship to changes in, in laryngopharyngeal pH. And I think that, that without this data, it's, it's difficult to interpret the results of conflicting studies. Uh, particularly in, in a, what is likely to be a, a heterogeneous patient population with, resp with respect to PPI responsivity. Uh, so we sought to, to conduct a, a, a simple study uh, in, in LPR patients who have undergone uh, PPI therapy comparing symptomatic improvement with changes in laryngopharyngeal pH uh, and, and secondarily uh, to characterize uh, different PPI response subgroups. So we, uh, we conducted a retrospective analysis of records from consecutive patients, uh, all seen at a single clinical site between 2009 and 2012. Uh, we included patients who had abnormal pretreatment symptom scores measured using uh, the reflux symptom index, or RSI. This is a validated self-administered questionnaire. Uh, all patients had abnormal pretreatment pH studies as measured using upright and supine Ryan scores. Uh, we collected this data using the ResTech DX pH probe. All patients uh, received omeprazole or pantoprazole, 40 milligrams BID for at least four weeks, and all patients included had post-treatment RSI scores and pH studies available. And these are the results uh, for the entire group. Uh, there are 43 patients that we included, 28 women, 14 men. The dark bars represent the pretreatment values for the RSI or the symptom scores, and the two uh, pH scores, the upright and supine Ryan scores. The light bars represent the post-treatment values and those red lines represent the normalization thresholds. So as a group, while the symptom scores and both of the pH scores all significantly decreased, only the symptom scores normalized. Uh, we then looked at the numbers of individuals who did and did not have pH normalization and or symptom normalization shown in this contingency table here. Uh, and what we found is highlighted here, uh, while most patients had symptom normalization, most patients did not have pH normalization. And moreover, in our data, every single patient whose symptoms normalized also had normalization of the pH scores. So there were three groups of, of patients that we observed. Uh, in the first group, the, these are individuals whose both symptoms and pH scores normalized. We call this group, this group the responders. Uh, there was a second group where the symptoms normalized, but the pH scores did not normalize. So uh, we call those group the, that group the partial responders. And then finally, there was a third group who's, who uh, had neither symptom nor pH normalization, and we consider uh, these uh, individuals to be non-responders. And these are the results for those three groups, the pre- and post-treatment results. For the non-responder group, we found that uh, there really was no no significant change in, in symptom or pH scores. Uh, for the partial responder group, we found that there was a significant reduction in the symptom score in the RSI, which is expected because uh, we define this group in terms of symptom normalization. 
However, we also found that the upright Ryan score, the upright pH score, significantly decreased as well, although it did not achieve normalization. The supine pH score didn't change at all in this group. And then, as expected, uh, because of the way we defined this group, the, the responders all had the responders had significant uh, decreases in, in the symptom score and the pH scores. Uh, we also looked at a number of correlations, and I'll just highlight a couple here. Uh, at the top, the top graph, uh, for the entire group of patients, uh, we found a significant, uh, a strong uh, positive correlation uh, between the pretreatment symptom scores and the pretreatment upright pH scores. And we also found, shown at the bottom here, uh, a significant correlation in the improvement in symptoms to the improvement in the upright pH uh, score following uh, treatment. So as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, there, there are surprisingly, surprisingly few of the studies uh, looking into uh, PPI treatment for LPR have objectively assessed pH after treatment. Uh, so the, the relationship between symptoms and pH after treatment is really not well characterized in the literature. Uh, of 19 open label studies, only four actually reported conducting post-PPI pH monitoring, and only two of those reported the results in relationship to symptom changes, but didn't discuss them in detail. Of uh, the 13 randomized controlled trials that have been conducted to date, only three of them have, have conducted post-treatment pH monitoring, and, and none of them actually report the results in relationship to symptom changes. Uh, so when we actually did that, uh, looked at the, the relationship between symptoms and, and uh, pH environment after treatment, we found, uh, at least in our data, that most subjects had symptomatic improvement, which was correlated uh, with a reduction in, in the laryngopharyngeal acid environment, although only a third of the, the patients actually had pH normalization. Uh, and moreover, we found that approximately a third of the patients uh, in, in our group subjectively and objectively failed to respond to PPI therapy. Uh, and of course, this study is limited by its retrospective design self-reported compliance, so we can't rule out in that, in that non-responder group poor medication, poor adherence to medication. So uh, in conclusion, uh, while most individuals uh, in this study did not have pH normalization, we found that only improvement was necessary for symptom normalization. Uh, in addition, we found that the pretreatment symptom and upright pH scores were positively correlated, and their improvements were positively correlated as well, supporting an acid reflux etiology, at least for some individuals. Uh, we, you know, we also found a third of the patients didn't respond to therapy. Uh, so I think that the results of this study suggest that LPR patients are indeed a, a heterogeneous uh, patient population uh, with respect to PPI responsivity. And PPI response may be one uh, confounding factor in previous studies that didn't account for that. Uh, so, uh, you know, we would recommend that in, in, in all future studies of LPR that post-treatment pH monitoring be conducted, uh, and this may help to, to alleviate some of the, the uh, sources of, of conflicting results in the literature. So thank you very much. I'd like to open this paper for questions from the audience, if there are any. Yes. Did you look at any of the demographic factors that predicted which group of patients might fall into the presence of reference? Yeah, actually, I don't know if I could show you. Uh, let me see. There's a hidden slide here. Um, oh, maybe it won't. It won't work. But we we did look at some correlations between some demographic uh, characteristics and and uh, changes in, in symptomatic improvement and, and pH improvement. And and interestingly, we found in and and I have to show you that slide because I don't remember exactly uh, which group, but I think it was in the, uh, in, in the, the group that responded most strongly to, to PPIs. We actually found uh, a significant correlation with uh, improvement in age, and that was, that was the only uh, uh, correlation to demographic uh, data that we found. So. Yes? Just use PPIs or uh, included LGBT? No, these patients were treated uh, only with, with uh, omeprazole or pentoprazole. Yeah. Uh, I just more comment that's Mike Friedman in Chicago. Um, his comment both on this paper and I think on the previous paper is just it's amazing to me that this disease is probably one of the very few diseases we treat um, without confirmatory evidence. It's just amazing to me that we have the technology to um, um, identify yes or no. We know that so many of our patients do not have um, uh, 
boot flux based on pH testing, yet we treat them. And uh, we have to realize that based on the recent uh, studies, PPI therapy is not completely without its morbidity. I think patients now, more than ever before, are concerned about long-term medication. Uh, if it's not essential. Uh, the studies showing osteoporosis associated with PPI therapy are an issue. Just even for short term, uh, patients are concerned. And I think um, uh, all of us have the obligation to consider testing, especially before long-term treatment, uh, and I think it's available. Granted, we don't have all the answers, but when we looked at this study, we were shocked to see how many patients did not normalize and how do we treat those. I think all of us should take another look. And the reasons on that survey that people gave for not uh, studying patients, well, economic costs, I mean, I think we, we do a lot of testing, and, and it's not a very expensive test. Uh, it's a very comfortable test. I've gone through um, uh, dual probe testing. I've gone through Bravo, and I think Restec is such a simple test that's accepted uh, by patients very easily, and I think it's very cost effective. So I think we should rethink um, uh, this disease process based on the principles that we all know, confirmation by testing. Well, that actually is a very good point. I uh, my question was going to be if you know did you have patients who rejected testing and and you you sort of alluded that patient compliance isn't a problem well, so. yeah there no uh, I, I don't say that every patient a lot of times when a patient comes in init initially we offer them two choices we say we can offer you um, paric treatment uh, but it might take three months of treatment uh, uh, would you like that uh, or would you like to be tested? Or we might say, would you like to start on a, a four to six weeks of treatment if you're not getting better, then be tested? So clearly not every one of our patients gets tested, but I think we offer to them, and I think a lot of our patients um, uh, are willing to be tested, and it's accepted uh, accepted very well. One that other might be worth mentioning in the manuscript is you know the, your and percentage the, compliance with yeah. your recommendation for now, testing. I want to mention one other point. Um, many of our patients have very poor compliance. We know that compliance for asthma medication, diabetes, is around 50 percent. Uh, compliance rates for PPI therapy is less than that. Mm -hmm. And there's two reasons. Uh, when we see a patient with postnasal drip and cough and clearing the throat, uh, yeah. We believe it might be due to uh, LPR, but do we really believe it? Because look at the studies that show placebo uh, equal effect. So I don't think we're totally convinced. We tell the patient, oh, you're um, hoarse or you're coughing or whatever it is because you have reflux. And the patient says, I don't have reflux. I don't have GERD. And we say, oh, 50% don't have GERD. But uh, neither the patient nor often the physician is convinced, which leads to very poor compliance. So we did a study where we looked at compliance and the patients who were tested were positive, their compliance versus patients who were not tested. The compliance was almost twice as high when they were tested and proven po positive. So that's another factor. Thank you for clarifying that. I think there was another question in the back, perhaps. Was that answered by that? Um, so what? Did you notice the correlation between the improvement between very severe acidic patients? Were they the ones that only partially normalized versus your right. moderate patients? Maybe right. There, there actually was a, a correlation between uh, the pretreatment symptom score and pH score and the degree of improvement over the entire group. Uh, it, it's hard to, to do those calculations in the subgroups because the, the correlations would be biased by the way we define the groups. But as, as, a, as a, a whole group, yeah, there, that certainly seems to be true. So. Thanks. Very good discussion. We're going to have to move on to Thank the you. next paper.